Welcome back to chapter 18, part two. In the second part of this lecture, we'll talk about what to do when a company makes a net loss and doesn't have any taxable income, how we deal with those tax losses. And we'll also talk about presentation and sum up some of the differences between IFRS and ASPE. So let's get going. So our, our sixth learning objective in chapter 18 is to account for tax loss carryover benefits, including any note disclosures. Tax loss would be unfair if companies were taxed during profitable, per profitable periods and received no tax relief during periods of losses. Therefore, a company pays no income tax in a year in which it incurs a tax loss, so negative taxable income, not accounting income, taxable income, and the tax laws permit taxpayers to use a tax loss of one year to offset taxable income of other years. Obviously, you can't do anything with your tax loss in the year that you incur it. So you can carry, you can use it for, to benefit other periods. So the rules around benefiting other periods is you can carry back a loss against taxable income of the immediately preceding three years or you can carry it forward to apply it against future taxable income to the next 20 years following the loss. So if the full amount of the loss cannot be absorbed by carrybacks, then it can be carried forward. If a loss is carried back, it is usually applied to the earliest available income. When tax losses are carried back, the tax returns for the preceding years are refiled and the current year tax loss is deducted from the previously reported taxable income and we get a revised income tax payable or income tax receivable for each year. This figure is then compared with the taxes that were actually paid for each of the preceding years and the government is asked to refund the difference because we would have already settled our, the tax due in the preceding years. And this illustration here just shows it illustrates the periods of tax loss. So it shows you can carry it backwards three years, immediately proceeding, and you can carry it forward 20 years. If it appears there will be income in the future to offset the loss carry forward, so speaking about the future 20 years here, if it appears there will be taxable income to offset the loss, the benefit should be recognized in our financial statements in the period of the loss. And we're gonna recognize this as a deferred tax benefit in the income statement and a deferred tax asset on our statement of financial position. The decision as to how to use a tax loss, carry back or carry forward, depends on factors such as its size, the results of the previous year's operations, and anticipated future tax rates or other factors. So we just talked about carrying forward a loss to the next, the future 20 years. So if it's if it's if we're likely going to generate taxable income, we're going to recognize that accrue it in our statement of financial position, just like we were accruing deferred tax assets um, before our break. Now, what happens if it's not more likely than not that the company will be profitable? So what if it's, it seems like the company, the reason that the company is incurring losses, it's not clear that the company is going to come off that path. Maybe they're going to keep incurring losses. So what happens then? Then we do not recognize the benefit of the carry forward in our financial statements. We would, of course, have to disclose it and its expiry dates, but if, if it's not more likely than not that we're going to be able to recognize it, we don't actually accrue it in the financial statements, and that's really important. This is a really common issue because if a company is generating tax losses, unless there's some sort of really specific reason why they incurred a tax loss in one year, they may be on a path where they may be incurring tax losses for many years, or maybe they're a startup company and they don't have a, pla a plan or they don't have a path. They have a plan, but they don't have the the experience behind them or the the um the past showing that they're going to generate income they're just trying to to cross that threshold and move into profit so if it's not more likely than not we're not going to recognize it if previously unrecorded tax losses so you're, you're in that situation where 
it's not more likely than not. And then all of a sudden it becomes more likely than not. The company crosses that threshold and all of a sudden they're profitable. And now it seems like all those tax losses will be able to be a benefit. Then you're going to recognize that benefit as soon as you cross that threshold. And uh, ASPE and IFRS account for the tax loss slightly differently. And we'll talk about that as we move through these slides. So let's look at a tax loss carryback example. So a company has taxable income for each year from 2017 to 2020. Assume there are no temporary or permanent differences in any of the years included. In 2021, the company incurred a tax loss they decided to carry back. And you can see that tax loss in 2021, our taxable income, again, we're talking taxable income, not accounting income. This is part of that reconciliation from accounting income to taxable income. So we're focused on taxable income here. We had a negative 500,000 of taxable income. So of course there was no tax paid. So how do we carry it back? Well, the, the loss carryback should be applied to 2018 first, the earliest available income, then to 2019 and 2020. So remember, we have to file, we have to, um, if we're going to carry it back, we need to apply it to the earliest income in the immediately preceding three years. So in this, in this example, that income is in 2018. So amended returns would reflect a total refund of 82,500 because we can see that in 2018, we paid 12,500 of tax. In 2019, we paid 30,000 and in 2020, we paid 40,000. So the sum of those three amounts gives us 82,500. And the actual taxable income on which the tax rate was applied to get the tax paid was 350,000. But we have a $500,000 tax loss, meaning we aren't able to absorb all of it by carrying it back in the, in the, by carrying it back three years. So we're gonna need to carry it forward. It's important to note in this example that 2017 is shown as a bit of a trick. Don't forget, you can only carry it back the immediately preceding three years. That means the year of the loss and then three years prior. So 2017 is four years prior, so it's not applicable. So that $75,000 uh, taxable income that resulted in tax of 22,500, that's irrelevant. It's past the carry back period. So when we recognize the benefit of the tax loss carry back, and this is always a benefit, even if the company if the company has taxable income to offset in the immediately preceding three years, we're always going to have an entry here um, because the past is the past. We know whether we paid tax or not. In the future, that's where we have to kind of figure out, is it more likely than not that we're going to have taxable income? But the past, we know. Did we pay tax or not? What can we apply? So in this case, we know that we can we can claim back 82,500 of tax that we paid in the immediately preceding three years. And our journal entry to recognize that is going to be debit income tax receivable, which is a current asset on our statement of financial position where we'll actually get cash from the government. They'll actually send us a check. And uh, credit current tax benefit through our income statement. So this is a, um, a revenue account or, or a contra expense that's going to go through the tax section of our income statement. Presentation on the income statement. So you can see here, we're going to have uh, income before taxes. We're going to have the income tax benefit. And then we actually show it as a separate line in this section called current benefit due to loss carryback, 82,500. So our net income will be uh, negative for 417,500. So when we put the impact of a loss carry back through our income statement or a carry forward, it is going to reduce our, well, it's gonna reduce our loss or increase our income depending on what it is. We would have had a loss if we have a tax loss to carry back. So it's gonna reduce the loss. So it's actually going through as a recovery on our income statement. Okay, so now we used the maximum of the 350,000 that we had available for the immediately preceding three years, but we still have 150,000 left because remember we had 500,000 of unused tax losses. The immediately preceding three years, you gave us 350,000 of taxable income using that base, not tax paid. So we can now carry forward 150,000 of tax losses. 
of tax of tax losses. So the company has 150,000 tax loss that can be carried forward. Assume that it is probable that the company will generate sufficient revenue in taxable income in the future so that the benefit of the remaining 150,000 will be realized. So what does this mean? It means that it's more likely than not that this company is gonna generate taxable income in the future so they can use up these tax losses. So therefore we wanna recognize it. So the asset that we're gonna recognize at, for the tax loss carry forward is going to be the tax losses times the tax rate. So don't forget, we're talking, there's, it's really important to distinguish between the tax taxable income, which is the base, and then times the tax rate gives you taxes paid. So we need to make sure we're really clear on which of those two um, terminologies we're talking about. So when we talk about the 150,000, that's part of the base. So what's the actual benefit we're going to get? Well, we're going to get a carry forward of this loss times the tax rate. So it's going to be the actual benefit that we're going to get is going to be 150,000 times the 20% tax rate, which is going to give us a benefit of $30,000. So we're, to recognize the benefit of the carry forward, we're going to go debit tax asset of 30,000, which is that, that the fact that we have this recovery in the future, it's not a, re it's not a receivable because we can't get a check. It's a tax asset. It's a deferred tax asset, just like the deferred tax assets we saw previously. And then credit deferred tax benefit, which goes through our income statement as a reduction of our total income tax expense. The benefit from the carry back on the carry forward are shown separately on the income statement. So again, here's a partial income statement for illustration. So we've got the loss before income taxes of 500,000. We've got the current benefit due to loss carry back of the 82,500. And that went through our statement of financial position as income tax receivable. And then we've got the deferred tax benefit due to the tax loss carry forward. And that went through our income statement as a deferred tax benefit. And that total of the two the carry back and the carry forward is 112,500, which is going to reduce our loss. So we had a loss before tax of 500,000, but we have these two tax recovery accounts. So now our net net loss is going to be 387,500 after tax. Okay, now assume that in 2022, the company returns to profitability and has taxable income of $200,000 subject to a 20% tax rate. They can now realize the benefit of the tax loss carry forward that we recognized or that we accrued in 2021. So let's look at the calculation of our revised taxable income, income tax payable and current tax expense. So we're gonna have taxable income before the tax loss carry forward, just from that reconciliation accounting income to taxable income. So we had 200,000 and that was given in the question. And then the tax, tax loss carry forward deduction. Remember, of course, we're not gonna apply the carry back. We already dealt with that. It's just the carry forward that we're dealing with. So we're gonna reduce the taxable income. So this is the base again, not times the tax rate. This is the base. We're subtracting 150. So now we have revised taxable income of $50,000 and our tax rate is 20%. So we're going to have an income tax payable of $10,000. And that's our current tax expense. Now, what, how does our deferred tax balance work? Because we just used up the 150,000. Remember, the 150,000 times the tax rate gave us this deferred tax asset of 30,000. So we need to clear that out because of course, now we're utilizing the deferred tax asset. We don't have another, we, we've used up the asset, shouldn't be in our statement of financial position anymore. So we're gonna go, uh, the opening balance was 30, we need it to be zero. So that means, so remember, what happens on our statement of financial position, if we have an account, it has $30,000 in it as an asset, but we need it to be zero. Well, that difference needs to flush through our income statement so we can adjust that account to the right amount. So we're gonna recognize $30,000 as deferred tax expense through our income statement. And that will bring that deferred tax asset account on our statement of financial position to zero, which is where we need it to be. And of course it should be at zero because we're using up the tax losses. So there's nothing else that should be on our balance sheet related to them. 
So the journal entries to record the income for 2022 are going to be, remember we've got that net of $10,000 current tax. So we're gonna go debit current tax expense, credit income tax payable of 10,000. And then we're gonna recognize our deferred tax expense. As we said, that's gonna go through our income statement because we need to bring down the asset account on the, on the statement of financial position. And then we are going to decrease the deferred asset account by 30,000, which will clear that account out. Okay. So Grohl's income statement below shows that the 2022 total income tax expense is based on 2022's reported income. The benefit of the tax loss is not reported in 2022. It was already reported in 2021. Okay, that makes sense because it was already reported in 2021. Let's see what that means here. In 2021, this is in 2021 when we recognize these amounts. And we, this is 2022, so it seems like we have current and deferred tax of 10 and 30 again, but um, the tax loss is not reported. It was already reported. So we're not capturing anything through our income statement here because we had already accrued these amounts on our statement of financial position. Okay, let's move forward. Continuing with the facts, a tax asset or income tax receivable was recognized in 2021 because Grohl knew that the company would receive 82,500 of benefits from the $350,000 of the tax loss. Yes, we agree with that. This left 150,000 of tax losses to carry forward. We now assume that the company's future profitability is uncertain. So it's not more likely than not that there will be enough evidence that the future tax, that there will be future taxable income to deduct these losses against. So what did we say that we do when that happens? Well, we said that if it's not more likely than not that the asset can be realized, that we will not recognize it in our financial statements. So discuss the amount of tax benefit growth should record. I think we just spoke about that. Prepare the tax-related journal entries, assuming the tax rate for future years will be 20% per year. And indicate how the loss carry forward would be reflected. It would be in the notes of the financial statements, which would also show the expiry dates. So we already talked about the income tax receivable. That was the same as in our previous example. Um, the presentation shows that the the only presentation in our income statement now, because we're not recognizing the carry forward, will only relate to the benefit due to the carry back. So we are going to have income or loss before taxes of five hundred thousand. We'll have the current benefit due to the tax due to the loss carry back of eighty two thousand five hundred, which will give us a net loss of four hundred seventeen thousand five hundred. And then in our notes to our financials, we'll have a note that says something along the lines of the company has not recognized any benefits associated with 150,000 of tax losses that are available for carry forward. These will expire in 2041. It's worth noting though, that of course we still recognize the benefit of the carry back. Like I said, you know if you've paid income in the past or not, so you can either get a refund or not. Right, but it's only the future that's uncertain where we need to meet this more likely than not threshold. And again, if we don't meet the threshold, so future income is not more likely than not, future taxable income again, not accounting income, taxable income, then we will not record any sort of a deferred tax asset. In our previous example, future income was more likely than not that we could record both the carry back, which we would record either way, and the carry forward. So therefore, that's when we recorded the deferred tax asset. Recognition of loss carry forward when realized. So assume that in 2022, unexpectedly, Grow became profitable. So now that they performed better than expected, generating taxable, they generated taxable income of 200,000 from its operations. After applying the 150,000 loss carry forward, tax is payable only on the balance of 50,000 of income. The tax rate is 20%. So how do we record 
that journal entry? Well, we don't have the deferred tax asset that we need to reverse because it was, it was not more likely than not that we would have taxable income that we could apply the tax losses to. So what we do is we simply adjust our current tax expense to take into account the tax loss carry forward. So rather than recognizing taxable income of 200,000 times 20%, we're simply gonna recognize 50,000 times 20% as our current tax expense, which you can see there. And we're just gonna record our regular current tax expense journal entry, which is debit current tax expense, credit income tax payable. And because the potential tax benefit associated with the cap with the loss carry forward was not recognized in 2021, because it was not more likely than not, we're just going to recognize it in 2022 by pushing it through the current tax expense. And of course, we'd have to disclose this under IFRS. We know IFRS requires all sorts of disclosure to help readers understand what's going on. So we would need to disclose the benefit of the loss carry forward under IFRS if it's significant and ASPE would not require it. So you can see that we could we would provide our income statement would simply look like this. There's no disclosure in here. It's simply income before income taxes, current tax expense of 10,000 and net income of 190,000. So there's no specific disclosure about the tax loss carry forward. It's simply flushed through current tax expense. It would give you an interesting effective tax rate, a very low effective tax rate. And one of the reasons that maybe an explanation for that is if you had uh, tax loss carry forwards that were not recognized in the year when they were incurred because they were not, the taxable income was not more likely than not, but they were recognized when taxable income was realized. Okay. So that pretty much sums up how we account for tax loss carry forwards under FRS. Now we're just going to take a few minutes and talk about a nuance under ASPE. So IFRS is exactly like we talked about. We're just going to talk only about ASPE for a couple of minutes and just talk about another way, that, the way that ASPE accounts for tax loss carry forward just ever so slightly differently. So in our earlier example, when we assumed that future income, future taxable income was uncertain and that there was not enough evidence to record the 150,000 of tax loss carry forwards, we didn't record a deferred tax asset. But ASPE allows us to recognize things according to IFRS, but it also allows us an accounting policy choice where we can use what's called a valuation allowance. So basically it gets us to the exact same place, which is why it seems like a bit of extra work but it's, it is an accounting policy choice and we do need to be aware of how to account for private entities. So the way that it works is that a deferred tax asset is recognized even if it's not more likely than not. So you recognize the deferred tax asset regardless, but then you layer a valuation allowance of 100% on top of the deferred tax asset. So realistically you have zero deferred tax asset in your financial statements because you have it there, but then you put an allowance on top of it. And that's essentially what the allowance account is. So let's take a look at how it would work. So assume that the entry for the loss carry back has already been made because the loss carry back is just very simple. Like we know what happened. So all we need to do is make the entry and wait for our check from the CRA. Um, but that the $50,000 carry forward, we want to recognize the entries under ASPE under this accounting policy choice to use the valuation allowance of the 150,000 loss carry forward and the valuation allowance to bring the deferred, asset, deferred tax asset account to its realizable value of zero. So we're making it clear that we still don't think that the deferred as tax assets more likely than not, but we're going to record it and then put a 100% valuation allowance against it. So the allowance account would say, okay, recognize the deferred tax asset. So 150,000 of tax losses times 20% is gonna give us debit deferred tax asset, current asset on a statement of financial position of 30,000 and credit ta deferred tax benefit through our income statement. And then, we're gonna and then we're going to record debit deferred tax expense offsetting the deferred tax benefit above. So those two kind of wash out. 
And then credit allowance to reduce deferred tax asset to expected realizable value of 30,000 and that zeroes out the tax as deferred tax asset account or at least offsets. When I say zero out, these could be in separate jail accounts. So you might have this amount and then the opposite amount in an account below. So you can see the, the gross numbers, but on a net basis, it zeroes it out. So, and the last entry, which sets up the valuation account, indicates that there's not enough evidence that the company will benefit from the tax loss in the future. So now assume that the company performs better than expected in 2022, generating the taxable income of 200,000. After applying the tax loss carry forward, tax is payable only on 50,000. With a tax rate of 20%, we have the exact same entry as we had under IFRS. So we wash that difference through current tax expense. So we're gonna have debit current tax expense, credit current credit income tax payable. And because the amount of losses available to carry forward in future years has changed, the deferred tax account and its valuation account are adjusted and they're all at zero now because we've used up all of our tax losses, tax loss carry forwards. So we're simply going to reverse those accounts out. So now we're going to go uh, debit deferred tax expense, credit deferred tax asset and then debit allowance and credit deferred tax benefit. So just clearing those amounts out. And again, the journal entries essentially net each other off. The deferred tax expense of 30,000 cancels out the $30,000 tax benefit, deferred tax benefit. So the income statement would only report net the current tax expense of $10,000. And that takes us through the valuation approach uh, via ASPE. And again, the valuation approach is not permitted under IFRS. Under IFRS, if income is not, if taxable income, future taxable income is not more likely than not, we do not record a deferred tax asset at all. Okay, but learning objective number seven. Explain why the deferred tax asset account is reassessed at the statement of financial position date and account for the deferred tax asset with and without a valuation allowance account. Under ASPE. Okay, like all assets, the deferred tax asset must be reviewed at year end to ensure that the carrying amounts are appropriate based on conditions that exist at the statement of financial position date. This depends on whether taxable income will be earned in the future against which these different, I guess, against which the tax losses can be deducted. And if it's unlikely, the income tax asset may have to be written down. So just because at one point we thought it was more likely than not that we would earn future taxable income to apply those losses against, that could change. Um, so if it changes, we need to write it down. And the deferred tax asset account is also reviewed to determine if it may need to be written down or if we should be recognizing anything we previously didn't recognize. Maybe it is now more likely than not. Let's take a look at an example. Assume at the end of 2021, a company has recognized a deferred tax asset of $200,000 based on a loss carry forward of a million dollars because it is more likely than not that enough taxable income will be generated in the future. At the end of 2022, the loss carry forward remains, but only 750,000 is now more likely than not the tax rate is 20%. So we need to write the account down. So the deferred tax asset has to be revalued from 200,000 to 150,000, which is the 750,000 taxable income that's now considered more likely than not times the tax rate. So the direct adjustment to write the account down is debit deferred tax expense. Remember, anytime we need to adjust a deferred, a deferred uh, asset on our balance sheet or deferred liability, it's going to go through the, um, the deferred tax expense account through our income statement. So we have that 50,000 and then we're going to reduce the deferred tax asset by 50,000. And if we were accounting for this via ASPE and if we had an accounting policy choice to recognize the allowance method, then we're going to recognize debit deferred tax expense, so going through the income statement, and we're going to credit the allowance to reduce the deferred tax asset to net realizable value. We're going to reduce that. We're going to set that account up because previously we wouldn't have had an allowance to reduce that, that deferred tax asset balance in essence to that 50000 
At the end of the next year, the deferred tax asset is revalued to 170,000 based on 850,000 of the original 1 million being deductible under tax rate of 20%. So now we need to write it down or we're gonna write it up actually from 150,000 to 170,000. So to write it up, we're gonna go under IFRS, we're gonna go debit deferred tax asset, increasing the asset by 20,000 and crediting the deferred tax benefit, it's a positive income statement account, revenue going through the tax section of 20,000 and the allowance, we're gonna reduce the allowance to 20,000 and credit the deferred tax benefit account. Okay, sources of taxable income available to realize a tax benefit. So future reversals of existing temporary differences enable us to realize tax benefits. So future income before taking into account reversing temporary differences, tax losses and other deductions, taxable income available in prior carryback years and tax planning strategies implemented to realize the deferred tax asset. So basically this is outlining how, how are we gonna utilize the deferred tax asset? Well, reversing, so either by generating taxable income or if we have reversing temporary differences that are gonna create taxable income, we can use those to utilize the tax loss carry forwards. Um, and we can, again, try to focus on carrying back income if it's not more likely than not. Objective number eight, identify and apply the presentation and disclosure requirements for income tax assets and liabilities and apply intra-period tax allocation. So our statement of financial position presentation, so we're gonna have income taxes receivable and payable as a current. If we have a loss carryback, we've got income taxes receivable, it's gonna be a current asset. Under all methods, current income taxes payable or receivable are reported separately from deferred tax assets and deferred tax liabilities. So we're definitely not gonna net those tax accounts, they're gonna be shown gross. If there's a debit balance in the payable from installment payments, it's gonna be recorded as a prepaid income tax. We haven't talked a lot about this, but we have current tax expense, but we are also in making payments towards current tax expense. So you could actually end up with a tax refund because you might've over, over accrued your current tax expense, in which case you could have a prepaid income tax or income tax receivable account. And an income tax refund from a lost carryback is reported as an income tax receivable and as a current asset. Deferred tax liabilities. So IFRS requires all deferred tax assets and liabilities be reported as non-current items. I may have previously said these were current, but clearly they're non-current. So let's make sure we remember that. Under ASPE, future income tax assets and liabilities are segregated into current or non-current. If not related to an asset or a liability, future income tax is classified, is classified according to the expected date of reversal or realization. And under IFRS and ASPE, deferred tax assets and liabilities cannot be netted unless they relate to the same taxable entity and authority, and there is a right to settle net. So it's easier if we just show them separate. Intra-period tax allocation. So this is the basis for how income tax expense or benefit current and deferred is reported. And this is just this period of, this is just this concept of trying to match the accounting income and the taxable income, reconciling them, making sure that this is encompassing all the differences that are arising in the taxable income. The objective is to report the cost benefit in the same period as the underlying transaction. So you can see an example of a presentation here. We've got our current tax benefit, current tax expense, et cetera. You can also have deferred tax expense specifically on OCI. So if you look down in the statement of comprehensive income, the second part of that statement that's shown, you can see that we've got net income and then we've got comprehensive, other comprehensive income, which will be a flashback from 3110. And we've got unrealized gains on fair value OCI investments of 25,500 going through there. And we do have a deferred tax expense specifically related to those unrealized gains because normally those gains can only be taxed when they're realized, whereas these are unrealized. So we have a future income tax uh, liability related to those. Actually, it's a future income tax asset, I'm sorry. So then our total tax would be uh, it would bring our comprehensive income up to 371,250. 
Actually, it is a different tax liability. Forgive me. Okay, moving on. Income and other statement presentation. So I for ask when practical, the tax effect should be traced back to where the transaction originated. And basically this is saying that we want to um, make sure that we, we present when related transactions are recognized and retain earnings or OCI of a prior period. So we try to present the same statement in the prior period if the transaction was originated and income taxes are charged or credited to various equity accounts only for items recognized in the current period under ASB. Disclosure requirements. So ASB calls for limited tax disclosure. IFRS has more extensive disclosure requirements, sources for both current and deferred tax, the amount of current and deferred tax recognized in equity, the reconciliation of effective and statutory tax rates, information about de unrecognized deferred tax assets, and information about each type of temporary difference and deferred tax asset or liability recognized. So analysis, uh, taxes can assess our quality of earnings. They can be profits that are improved by favorable tax, ex tax effects should be examined carefully, looking at that effective tax rate. Taxes can help us predict our cash flows by looking at those deferred tax asset and liability accounts. We know what kind of tax outflow or inflow we're going to have in the future or tax savings we're going to have in the future. And the CRA has some very detailed data analytic checks um, and they use text mining and they do a variety of things to try to make sure that the tax expense makes sense according to their data mining software. Okay, let's get through that. Learning objective number nine. Identify the major differences between ASPE and IFRS for income taxes. We talked about some of these most, we've talked about all of these, I should say, as we've gone through the chapter, but ASPE allows an accounting policy choice for, remember the taxes payable method that we talked about where you can just forget about deferred taxes, just record to current income tax expense. Like how simple is that? but conceptually it's not overly sound. So it's too simple, but it's an option. So that's the taxes payable method. IFRS requires the use of the temporary difference approach, which ASPE just calls the future income taxes method and both the calculations between ASPE and IFRS, assuming IFRS, I mean, sorry, assuming ASPE chooses to follow this method, IFRS requires it, the calculations are the same. And the main differences relate to the terminology, which we went through. IFRS refers to things as deferred and ASPE tends to refer to these things as future income tax. And the classification of deferred and future tax assets on the statement of financial position, IFRS requires these to all be classified as non-current. The use of evaluation allowance for uh, tax loss carry forwards can only be used under ASPE, not under IFRS. We always use a direct approach under IFRS and the extent of disclosure under IFRS for all income taxes is much more significant than ASPE. Looking ahead, <clears throat> so there are some amendments to IAS 12 that were being looked at under the, especially related to the recognition of deferred tax assets for unrealized losses. There's also been, there's also been some uh, publications on the uncertainty over income tax treatments and essentially we're still, these projects are still in, in, in progress. And the decision regarding the amount to record should be based on which method provides the best prediction of how the uncertainty will be resolved. And that is it. We made it through chapter 18, congratulations. Please join me for the tutorial section so we can put what we just learned into practice.